Good afternoon, everyone. We can do better than that. Good afternoon. All right, let's try a different language. Buenas tardes. Thank you. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to acknowledge that the Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Monoma, Wasco, Cowlitz, Catlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. I take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. I also invite all of us to invest time, energy, and resources by learning more about the tribes whose lands we inhabit. Let's visit their cultural centers, shop at native-owned businesses, support native nonprofits, and take care of the land. And at the very least, next week when some are celebrating Columbus Day, I invite each and every one of us to pause, honor, and recognize the contributions of indigenous people all over this world. And before moving forward, I do want to take a moment to thank uh, the organizers of the committee, Percy Winters, thank you for your generosity, Sylvia, gracias, and Carolyn Lee, who have dedicated uh, endless, towers, endless hours to make sure that, uh, that I was able to, to be here. I also want to acknowledge the Oregon Convention Center staff. Thank you for allowing us to, to be served. The technology folks who are, are making sure that you can see me and, and, uh, and listen to me clearly. Thank you very much. It is an incredible honor for me to be here, and I also recognize that it is a great privilege for all of us to be able to dedicate an entire day to bettering ourselves in the service of others. I'd like to start by sharing a bit about me, my background, and why I'm all in for serving our community. By the way, uh, I'll give you a heads up that I brought pictures for all of you. I'm a, I'm a visual learner, and I, and I like to bring, uh, I like to show and tell about that. I'll start by acknowledging that I am a son, a husband, a, a brother, a father, an abuelo, yes, a grandfather, to a beautiful three-year-old little girl named Miliana. I'm also very proud to be an immigrant and a first-generation college graduate, but the journey here has not been an easy one. Thank you. I was just, I'll start by saying, by starting my story when I was nine years old. My family arrived to Oregon from Mexico, from a small town in Michoacan to rural Hood River is where my family settled. And it was a big change. People dressed differently, they ate different foods, they spoke a different language. Everything about the new town was different. And I quickly realized that when you yourself are different, it's very easy for the majority culture around you to tell you who you should be. And that's when my name was changed. It happened during a fifth grade morning roll call. I remember precisely the fifth grade teacher going down the list and she said, John, and John responded here. And then she went to Kimberly and Kimberly responded with that prepubescent voice here. And then Kimberly and Kimberly said here. And then she got down the list, halfway down the alphabet, to my name. And she looked at the paper, and she said, H, her, J, Jerry. She settled on Jerry. How do you go from Gerardo to Jerry? <laughs> and just like that, without realizing it, she not only changed my name, but the rest of my life. When my family immigrated from Mexico, I was just nine years old. I didn't speak English at the time, and I was taught to respect my elders, including my teachers. So I didn't question it. I just went along with it. What I wanted to do was fit in, and fit in with time I did. But fitting in came with a price. You see, my name was first changed in the classroom, and then it was changed throughout the school, and then the entire community. 
And before long, few people actually knew my real name. It had become an out-of-control wildfire. I accepted my new name, but as time passed, I knew that it wasn't me. I felt ashamed, dirty, like a fraud. I felt like I sold it out. Some of my friends understood. You see, Juan had become John. Maria had become Mary. Pedro had become Pete. Others just didn't understand what the big deal was. Most importantly, I felt like I let my people, like I let my family down. Everyone thought they knew me, but they couldn't have known my real struggle. For a long time, I felt a lot of guilt because I let it happen. But now I realize that I was just nine years old. I was young, powerless, voiceless. I didn't even speak the language yet. In fact, from fifth grade all the way to my senior year in high school, people called me Jerry. It was written everywhere except for my legal documents. It was on my school ideas you saw, the school yearbook, and the local newspaper. They even misspelled my fake name. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. The name Jerry I actually really like. The only problem I have with it is that it was not my name. But it had become just a bad dream that would not end. And I needed to wake up. I needed a fresh start. I needed to reclaim my identity, my name. My story is likely not much different than many immigrant stories. I am the oldest son in a family of six, and I am proud to be the first person in my entire family to graduate from college. My parents only finished an elementary school education, and they made great sacrifices so that my siblings and I could have a better future. When I asked uh, my parents why they came to the US, they said, to have a better future. And when I dug deeper and asked them what they wanted for their kids, they said, to study. To many of our parents, to study meant finishing high school. But times have now changed. A high school education is no longer enough. To study now means finishing college. We now know that, the edu that education is one of the social determinants of health, and people who have access to a quality education, healthcare, public safety, transportation, affordable housing, among others, leads to healthier and thriving individuals and communities. All of us present here today have a direct impact in the health of both people and communities. As a person of color, living and studying in a predominantly white environment has not been easy. In college, I faced many obstacles as a first-generation college student. But I also learned all the things that I needed to learn, but I was never taught in my public high school. I learned about Chicanismo, about immigrant rights, ethnic studies. I learned about racism, oppression, bias. I learned about all the isms that I needed to learn about, which were the reasons why my name was changed. Most importantly, what I really learned about was me. I learned that when you don't know who you are, others around you will tell you who you should be. I learned all the things that I needed to learn in order to reclaim my history, my culture, my story, my name. And like washing it off my body, I said goodbye to Jerry and I embraced Gerardo. Those of you who are first generation college graduates know very well that being first is hard. I went from a small rural public high school to the University of Oregon, where close to 20,000 students attended. U of O had more students than my rural town had people. Living in Eugene, trying to figure out a new public university system and surviving was incredibly difficult. I was a small fish in a huge pond. In college, there were times when I felt lonely, isolated, overwhelmed, and I began to doubt myself. I questioned why I was in college to begin with. I felt like I didn't belong, like I wasn't good enough, like I wasn't smart enough, like I didn't speak good enough English, and honestly, like giving up. I felt guilty because my, I was being given opportunities I knew my family would never have. I miss my family, I miss the home-cooked meals, and I struggled to pay my bills. In fact, it got so bad that there were days that I went without eating because I could not afford the food. I knew too well that calling my parents for money was not an option. They didn't even have a bank account at that time. 
My parents were trying to figure out how to support their parents. What I was trying to figure out is how to support my parents. And that's the transformational power of systems and organizations. With their support, I stand here today confident that my kids will not have to worry about how they're going to support me. Whether you work in transportation, city or county government, education or something else entirely, the work you do on a daily basis makes a huge impact in the lives of the people in our community. People of all ages need every one of us to bring our best selves every day in the service of others. But believe it or not, being a first generation college student was not my biggest obstacle. My first year in college, I was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. This is a thyroid disease that produces too many chemicals in our body. It was making me very hyper. I had a lot of energy. In fact, at one point, I weighed 110 pounds. Don't let that smile fool you. I was very sick at this time. I was skinny. I couldn't sleep. My heart was beating so fast that my doctor told me to stop playing all sports because he was afraid I would have a heart attack. 19 years old, afraid of a heart attack. Now, since I had too much energy, sitting down to read a college textbook was nearly impossible. Sleeping, non-existent. I could not be still. Now, when you have that kind of energy in college, what do you think that does to your GPA? In fact, let me ask you a question. What do you think my GPA was my first year in college? Anyone? Blurt it out. Close. 1.1. Now, I don't know if any of you ever had grades like mine, but when you're a person of color struggling in a predominantly white environment that everyone around you seems to have already figured out, you begin to doubt yourself. I started to internalize all the stereotypes about men of color, specifically Mexican men. Maybe I should work with my body and not my mind. So there I was, a lonely, overwhelmed, skinny, first-generation college student with a reclaimed identity and a 1.1 GPA. I needed to dig deep and find the source of my inspiration. And that's when I realized that in order to move forward, I needed to look back. It had been almost 10 years since my family had immigrated from Mexico, and I needed to know why. What I learned surprised me, it angered me, but it also made me incredibly proud. I learned that in the 1940s and 50s, the Bracero Guest Worker Program recruited farm workers from Michoacan to come work in the fields of California, Washington, and all over Oregon. My grandfather was one of them. He paved the way for my dad to cross the border over 15 times in the span of 15 years. That's him in the cool red bell bottoms on the ladder. <laughs> he is Alfonso Jr. My dad was a farm worker in Mexico, and he did not have the opportunity to go to school. But he valued education so much that at the age of 19, he went back to his elementary school to complete his elementary education. For an entire year, he sat in that class with other 11-year-olds. Yeah. For the first 10 years of my life, I only saw my dad for six months at a time. Little did I know that he was sacrificing his goals and his dreams so that I could have a better future. This particular part of my story should not surprise any of us. Oregon has a long and complicated history with immigrants who call Oregon home. Now, since I am a beneficiary of a great public education and I study both sociology and history in college, I'm gonna take a few minutes to share part of what I consider the people's history of Oregon. Consider this an Oregon History 101 lesson. Please bear with me if you have already learned this, but given the fact that Portland continues to be a top destination to move to, I suspect some people here might be new to Oregon and may not know this part of Oregon history. I also believe that in order to move forward, we have to know where we have been. This year marks the 76th anniversary of Executive Order 9066 signed by President Roosevelt which authorized the internment of Japanese immigrants all over the West Coast. Innocent Japanese men 
women, children, farmers, and business owners were vilified and interned during World War II. According to the Oregonian, more than 100,000 people lost their homes, livelihoods, and freedom. More than 4,000 were rounded up in the Portland area alone. Imagine that, just 7.5 miles north of here, where the Portland Expo Center currently sits, roughly 4,000 Japanese people lived in these decrepit quarters roughly half a year before being shipped to a more permanent and more deplorable camp in Minidoka, Idaho. According to the Oregon Historical Society, and I quote, the camps were prisons with deplorable living conditions located on desert plains and the rapidly constructed barracks meant that those held there faced blistering heat in the summer and bone chilling cold in the winter, end quote. Now I'm no psychologist, but I think about the impact that internment has on the mind. I'm no doctor either, but I, but I have to wonder what being in prison does to the body. I'm no financial expert, but if someone stole my family wealth, my family business, I know it would have a detrimental long-term impact on future generations of my family. World War II not only changed our country, but also the people living in it. In 1942, during a time when the US needed labor, under a wartime agreement with Mexico, Mexico provided half a million workers to the US. Braceros, which is a Spanish word for people who work with their hands. Between 1942 and 1947, Oregon recruited 15,000 braceros who came to Oregon to work in our agricultural fields and railroads all over Oregon. Although Latino presence in Oregon can be documented back to the Oregon census of 1850, the bracero program paved the way for an influx of Mexican immigrants who would later settle throughout Oregon. My grandfathers, and later my dad, paved the way for my family. That is my, that is my grandfather. This is Alfonso June Sr., excuse me. Settlement didn't come easy for the braceros. When the Bracero program ended in 1947, the cost of transporting the temporary workers shifted to the employer. But that cost soon became a burden to employers, and it was left up to each individual to pay their own way to Oregon if they wanted Oregon jobs. People made their own way for sure, all over the West Coast from Mexico, and by 1950, a military operation called Operation Wetback rounded up a million undocumented Mexican workers and sent them back to Mexico. In Oregon, immigrants who lived in cities like Woodburn, Hood River, Hillsboro, and other small towns lived in constant fear of sweeps on the road and raids in the workplace. This fear continues to this day. This is an article in the Oregonian just from a couple years ago. Now it's interesting to me that when the US economy is weak, we recruit immigrant labor. Is it then any surprise that as, that as our current economy remains relatively strong for some, our country vilifies and demonizes immigrants? It's not just immigrants whom Oregon has not been friendly to. Policies, practices, and racist rhetoric has devastated the black community in Oregon as well. Oregon has a deep-rooted history of exclusion, racism, and resistance to change. In 1844, when slavery was banned, Oregon passed a law requiring African Americans in Oregon to leave the state. Three years later, Oregon adopted a state constitution banning black people from visiting, residing, or holding property in the state. According to the Oregon Historical Society, and I quote again, blacks attempting to settle in Oregon would be publicly whipped, 39 lashes every six months until they departed. Although there is no documented record of any official whipping, the message was clear. In 1844, Oregon residents did not want black people in Oregon. Although this and other black exclusion laws were rendered moot by the US Constitution, it wasn't until 1926, 58 years later, that Oregon voters repealed the law. And it wasn't until 2002 that other racist language in the state constitution was removed. Now I'll be the first to admit, I've never read the state constitution, but I question whether all the racist language has actually been removed. 
Now, when a state is literally founded to be a white utopia, is it then surprising to see policy that excludes people who are not white? In the 1920s, racist covenants in home deeds appeared that read something to the effect of no Negroes, Chinese, or Japanese shall own or occupy property in this neighborhood unless they are a worker or a servant. I ask any, every one of you who may own homes in the Portland area to check your home deeds. These racist covenants, in combination with racist redlining, forced the black community to dislocate from black neighborhoods in Northwest Portland and funnel them to the Albina neighborhood. World War II brought an influx of African-American families, most of which lived in Vanport. And by 1945, the black population in Portland was more than 20,000. But when the Columbia River flooded and it destroyed Vanport, 16,000 black residents were displaced and many wound up renting aging, aging homes and apartments vacated by white Portlanders who moved to the suburbs. In case anyone is wondering where Vanport is at, allow me to show you on the Google map. But that's not all. The black workers who struggled to find jobs in white-owned businesses, the Albina neighborhood residents started to open their own businesses to serve the black community. By 1956, the Albina neighborhood was declared blighted due to 60% of housing considered substandard. Rather than investing in the community, local government had other plans. And landlords in Albina began to evict tenants, demolish buildings, and sell the land. As Portland planned and built the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, I-5 and Highway 99, the Rose Quarter in the 60s, and expanded Emanuel Hospital in the 70s, over half of the Albina neighborhood's black population was forced to relocate. Policy and structural racism has hit black people from the Albina neighborhood especially hard. A neighborhood that was once 68% black and thriving continues to be impacted to this day. And it continues to change rapidly. In Oregon, while black people were being banned during the mid-1800s, another horrible and intentional tragedy was happening. Land was being taken away from the native people and given to white male settlers during the resettlement period. With no viable option in an effort to maintain their traditional ways of life and identity, tribes ceded their homeland through negotiated treaties. In all, 2.5 million acres of Oregon land, including all of Portland, were open to white settlement and native residents were removed to one of the nine reservations. After World War II, the Indian Relocation Act of 1956 encouraged people to relocate from reservations into cities such as Portland for jobs and vocational training. Indigenous people would continue to leave the reservation to work and attend school. But for many, the federal programs just didn't work. Many struggled to find jobs, housing, and medical care, not prepared for city, for city life, and a city that was not prepared for them. Many were hampered by social and cultural barriers, including language, spiritual, and religious traditions and they were not provided adequate access to resources and the services that they needed. Black historian Walida Yamarisha argues that the founding purpose of an Oregon territory was to build a perfect white society. This led to the rapid rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and according to Yamarisha, Oregon had once the highest Klan membership per capita in the country. Now, if you think this is a thing of the past, let us consider that the Oregon Southern, excuse me, the, or, the Southern Poverty Law Center in the year 2000 was tracking fight hate groups in Oregon. As of today, they are currently tracking 15 hate groups in the state of Oregon. Eight operate statewide, one in Salem, one in Ashland, one in Tillamook, one in McMinnville, and four operate in Portland. This is not a thing of the past. So now what? As we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the needs of all people living in all our communities, 
It's important that we understand the history that has impacted the current policies, our current structures, our current practices, and more importantly, influence our present and more importantly, our future. Despite the divisive, racist, and sexist national and local rhetoric that we have all been subject to, I am encouraged by the laws that the Oregon legislature has passed recently. In housing, the landlord and tenant laws will provide much needed relief to many Oregonians struggling to keep up with the increasing cost of housing. In employment, Oregon will soon enact arguably the country's best paid family and medical leave law, 12 weeks of paid time off to new parents, victims of domestic violence, and those who become ill or need care for a sick family member. It also, yeah, let's give that one. It also includes people who may be in the country without documentation. Speaking of which, Oregon is now the 15th state to allow undocumented immigrants to obtain a driver's license. No one should have to break the law in order to drop off their children at school, to get to work, or to carry out their business and go see each and every one of you in your offices. I'm also happy this, le this legislature addressed this, uh, this long-coming inequity. Speaking of education, the passage of the Student Success Act will inject an unprecedented $1 billion per year to Oregon's public K-12 schools. I also have to thank the Native community because through their diligent leadership and, and long-time efforts, a tribal history curriculum will be ready to be implemented at the beginning of 2020. This curriculum includes lesson plans in science, math, history, language arts, health, and social studies. Learning about the tribal nations in Oregon is important for all students, but it is especially important for Native students to see themselves accurately reflected in the curriculum all people are learning. And last but not least, we need accountability. Oregon's new hate crime law changes the name of intimidation crimes to bias crimes, and it makes it a felony to threaten or assault an individual based on their membership in a protected class. I'd like to pause here for a moment and recognize and give a round of applause to all our elected officials who have taken bold steps in making Oregon a more equitable state. Thank you very much. Now I know very well that all of these laws are not perfect. And I also know that perfection gets in the way of good enough. Let me repeat that. Perfection gets in the way of progress. I also know we're not done. There's a lot of uncertainty among the immigrant community with the new federal public charge rule that will go into effect next week. I know this is a concern to many of you in the room. I'm also not blind. I know all of these laws have their critics, but we have to remember that inaction to inequitable laws is a tool privileged groups use to slow down change. But change, we must. The changing demographics of our state demand it. But let's be real. Change is hard, and diversity, equity, and inclusion work can be even harder. I've dedicated the last 15 years of my career helping our youth from marginalized communities reach their college dreams. I've also witnessed the race and ethnic demographics of our students completely shift in the last 10 years. As you continue to embark on this equity journey in your sector, your organization, and your teams, I'd like to leave you with a few words that I have learned after working with thousands of black, brown, white, Asian, and native students all over Oregon. These are your future colleagues, the doctors you will visit, the teachers of your kids, the people you will vote for one day, the students and families you currently serve. Number one, names matter. Every time I share the story about my name, I am comforted by the fact that I'm not alone. But I'm also disturbed by the fact that most people who connect with my story are immigrants and people of color. 
And I continue to ask myself, why? Recently, Nancy, who is sitting right here with me, and thanks for your support, my wife shared her, word, her, her thoughts with me in a way that made a lot of sense. She said, it's kind of like driving. When people have been privileged their entire lives to drive an automatic, when they meet you for the first time, you're asking them to drive a stick shift quickly on the spot. Some people can do it. Others are willing to learn and try. Others just simply refuse. But as our communities continue to become increasingly diverse, globalized, and different, the likelihood that we will encounter and meet people whose names we can't easily pronounce is going to increase. But we must be able to humble ourselves and make every effort to pronounce people's names correctly every single time. Beyond the fact that it's the right thing to do, taking the time to pronounce someone's name correctly leads to a greater sense of inclusion and belonging. As you return to your work environments and continue to take action towards racial equity and accountability, I invite you to get to know each other. Listen, to really listen to each other's name stories. When I have taken the time to listen, and I mean to really listen, we have developed more empathy and trust with students. Two things that I believe are essential for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Number two, national crises have local impact. Let's face it, we live in a globalized and interconnected world where we don't have to look for information. Information finds us. Let me be clear, when ICE rounds up hundreds of people working in Mississippi, that has a negative impact in our local Latinx community. When Eric Gardner says, I can't breathe, and there's no criminal charges brought against the officer, black people in Oregon feel it. When the polls in Oregon is attacked, LGBTQ people in Oregon are vulnerable. When white nationalists attack young Muslim women in our max lines, everyone in this country who wears a hijab feels threatened. If you recall, we lost two innocent active bystanders that May 26th day. We lost them due to racism and white supremacy. Let me assure you, people of color, and in particular, women of color, go around their business all throughout liberal and progressive Oregon, and they do it while often fearing for their own safety. I implore you, as you lead diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts with action and accountability, center the voices of historically oppressed groups. I do believe that meeting the needs of the most vulnerable will ultimately benefit us all. Number three, we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. As much as we would like, there is no blueprint for diversity, equity, and inclusion work. The reality is we are going to make mistakes. We are going to be in conflict. We will offend and we will be offended. But we must be willing to learn new concepts and allow ourselves to be vulnerable and uncomfortable. When we make mistakes, we also have to be willing to own them, apologize genuinely, learn, and more importantly, self-correct. Ignorance can lead to mistakes, and fear of making mistakes leads to inaction. I've already shared my thoughts about inaction. Now let me add that fear of making mistakes and ignorance are also tools privileged groups use to hang on to that privilege. Number four. We have to overcome our own guilt. In my work with students, faculty, and staff, I have come to learn that many people are carrying around a lot of guilt. At the risk of generalizing, I have witnessed many people of color, particularly immigrants, struggle to overcome family achievement guilt. That is the guilt associated with having opportunities other members of our family don't have. These new opportunities are new earned privileges that we must be able to manage in order to use our privilege for good. We cannot let guilt get in the way of leveraging our, our privilege. I have also learned that guilt gets in the way of many white people from fully engaging in diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I invite all white and light-skinned people in the room to engage in a serious self-reflection about overcoming guilt. If you are at the beginning of your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey, 
I invite you to look into the work being done by Dr. Robin D'Angelo, a white woman whose research focuses on white fragility and argues that fragility is simply a tool for maintaining white privilege. Number five, we have to care about caring. I love Oregon and I care greatly for all the people living in it. As I reflect on the conference theme, leading with racial equity through action and accountability, I know it's not gonna be easy. After all, what we're talking about here is rethinking our laws, our policies, our practices, our procedures, and equally important, our habits. There's no doubt in my mind that this work is hard, but I believe we're up to the challenge. As we think about what each of us does in order to serve the public, we are challenged to think differently about how we do our work. I want us to also think about why. I love living in Oregon, and I believe we can make it even better. I have dedicated my career to carrying out my life purpose of serving our youth through my vehicle of higher education. But to me, it is more personal than that. To me, it's about Millie, my three-year-old granddaughter. I want her to live a prosperous and abundant life where she will be valued, honored, and respected as the woman she will one day be. I want her to attend schools where all students thrive. I want her identities, whatever shape or form they turn out to be, to be seen as assets and not liabilities. I want all of us to have all the tools we need in order to provide the infrastructure she needs in order to be everything she wishes to be. And guess what? I want this for all of your children and all of your children's children and all of the children who will call Oregon home one day. So as you go about your day and carry out your own purpose, I leave you with one simple question. What is your why? Thank you very much for your time, for your dedication to the public sector and for your willingness to transform Oregon for good. Thank you. Please give Gerardo another round of applause. I'd now like to welcome to the stage Victoria Cross, award committee member for the Robert Phillips Regional Diversity Award. Thank you, Sylvia. I had really pleasure this year to serve on Robert Phillips Committee Award, which is truly a labor of love because we got to hear about incredible work that our colleagues are doing in the communities, and it's really a joy to recognize this work. Each year, the Northwest Public Employees Diversity Conference solicits nominations from our sponsoring jurisdictions to honor an employee, a work group, team, a department that has demonstrated a sustained commitment to diversity that goes beyond their day-to-day -day job requirements. This award, named after Robert Phillips, one of the founders of this conference, And this award embraces the spirit by which Mr. Phillips poured out so much for the cause of creating a more inclusive, diverse, and equitable workforce and region. Thank you to all those who wrote nominations this year, because you recognized the contributions of your colleagues. Let's And to, thank you to all the nominees for contributions and outstanding work you have accomplished. 
We would like to honor you now by reading your names. Please hold your applause till, until uh, the end. We have 21 nominees. Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Services Workplace Equity Strategic Planning Group from Multnomah County. Molly Franks from Multnomah County. Multnomah County Animal Services Field Team. Equity and Policy Development Team from the City of Portland. Interrupting Oppression Committee with the City of Portland. Edward Van Buren from the City of Portland. Elliot Aqua Scott with the City of Portland. Davisha Gordon from the City of Portland. Emily Mavraganis from the City of Portland. Michael Jordan from the City of Portland. Jacob Bestman from Multnomah County. Nicole Sharon from the City of Portland. Daniel Garcia from Multnomah County. Tasha Witt Delancey from Multnomah County. Enrique Vargas from Metro. Maria Magalon from Clackamas County. Will Cortes from Metro. Irene Concepcion Sestric from City of Portland. Dora Perry from the City of Portland. Scott Ellis from Metro and Court Morse from Post Prosper Portland. Just let us know it. Now, it's a really <laughs> pleasure and honor for me to introduce Robert Phillips, who has worked in the area of equal employment opportunities for over 25 years and has a long history of involvement in the civil rights fields. As a director of Multnomah County Affirmative Actions Office, Robert was responsible for development of policy, plans, initiatives, and programs that promote respectful work environments for diverse employees and assist the organization in meeting its equal employment opportunities and of affirmative action obligations. Robert also served as a commissioner for the Port of Portland Civil Service Commission, and his community service includes appointment to the Nike Corporation's Minority Affair Advisory Board, gubernatorial appointments for the State Commission on Black Affairs, and service on the Oregon State Bar Affirmative Action Committee. In addition, Robert was a recipient for the 2009 Arthur Fleming Award by the Multnomah County Managers of Color Resource Group. In 2012, the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaimed February 28 as a Robert Phillips Appreciation Day in Multnomah County, Oregon. Now in retirement from Multnomah County, Robert has a core career during which he serves as a member of the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs, Political Con Convention Planning Committee, and the Northwest Renal Patients Advisory Board, and the Port of Portland Fire Department Civil Service Board. Robert during his career touched many lives. He mentored many people and I was honored one of you be your mentee. I just want to tell how much uh, you impact my life, how you made great difference in my life. In what I can say just right now, just Robert, thank you for your time. Please. Thank you. Thank you. 
over time, you start moving around a little bit slower than you <laughs> regularly do, but praise God that uh, we're able to do that. I understand how important awards are. Uh, recently, I was honored to receive from the National Kidney Foundation a Excellent in Advocacy Award for fighting on behalf of kidney dialysis patients and their families and helping people to understand the disease is not them. They are who they are and they should prioritize their life based on that. I could relate to our speaker in his comments about being the first person in his family to graduate from college. I was also the first and my interesting experience was in 1969 when I graduated, the black students had just walked off the campus at Oregon State University. And the Urban League recruited me to attend college there even though I wanted to go to Howard University. I went in with 35 other students, mix of Hispanics, Native Americans, and Latinos, and uh, blacks, and four years later became the only one from that group to graduate from Oregon State University. Not only that, but I also became the first African American born and raised in Oregon coming out of their albino community to graduate from Oregon State University. <clears throat> It was not an easy task, like being involved with diversity and affirmative action and civil rights. There were many challenges and many obstacles, but we know it needed to be done. And we know we needed to open doors for others. And that was the thing that was most important because the president at that time of the university wanted to prove that educational opportunity programs, no matter how many minorities you recruited, none of them would graduate, all of them would fail. So the question would be, why do we need these programs? President Johnson said, it's only one come out of that program, then providing the federal funding, setting up the program would be worth it. And after I graduated, a number of other students fortunately came behind me and graduated. I was kind of wiped out of the history for a long time at OSU, and then recently some of the students rediscovered me and uh, want to have interviews and do some other things. And I'm honored that I could have provided that opportunity for them. During the weekend, I went to a friend's library book sale and one of the books caught my eye and it was from a lady titled Lesson Learned as an Older Woman. And she said, one of the things I learned is always eat your dessert first. <laughs> so hope all of you enjoyed your meal this afternoon. It was a wonderful meal and for those of you who ate your dessert first, you know it's okay. <laughs> this is tremendous that we stand here today with over 23 governments participating in the diversity conference. Over 1,500 attendees here and numerous others wanting to attend but could not. It speaks well to planting seeds and allowing them to grow. Initially, it was only Multnomah County uh, attending a diversity conference, and that was based on the fact that many times people would be spread out and go to one session here and one session there. And I remember telling Gladys that, you know, we all need to sit in the same room, we all need to hear the same thing, and we all need to go back and do the work that we should be doing. 
And she said, you know, you have a good point. Let's do something about it. So we set up the first diversity conference, which occurred at uh, Roosevelt High School. It was interesting trying to squeeze in the sitting student seats <laughs> at the time, but we were able to do it. And then when I became a further action officer, not only for Multnomah County, but for the city of Portland, the only person in the whole United States to manage two separate governments of further action programs, uh, I told Multnomah County and I told the city, we need to join forces and do it together. I'm not gonna be a further action office for two, officer for two separate governments and only one get the benefits of a diversity conference. So the city of Portland was brought on board and later Clackamas County. And like I said, uh, with the dedicated work of Carolyn Lee and Percy and others, they've grown this conference to the point where it exists today with a number of governments participating. All of us hearing the same message and hopefully all of us going back to the workplace to do the same thing. I like the title of the conference, Leading with Racial Equity Through Action and Accountability. One of the things I've told people is that this, for me, is an age of problem solving and solutions. We can no longer sit back and allow problems to exist from homelessness to racial conflicts, uh, inability of governments to be responsive to its citizenry. We have to solve problems and we have to come up with solutions, good or bad, to move us forward. And it's the same way with equity. I'm honored today to present the recipient of the Robert Phillips Diversity Award. I know there's a couple of other people here who's received the award in the past. If you are, why don't you stand and just wave? Victoria's one of them. <laughs> and it's a real honor to watch and see these people grow. A person who is reflective of uh, some of the things I mentioned early in terms of leading, taking action, being accountable, most of all the things that I value in my heart, problem solving issues, is our recipients of the Robert Phillips Award, Debbie Castleton, who has dedicated herself to the city of Portland for over 17 years working for environmental services as a project coordinator three in community outright, outreach and public involvement. For the past 12 years, she has volunteered her time and notice volunteered as chair of the diversity and empowerment employees of Portland which is referred to as DEEP, and is, proud, and is a proud founding member of DEEP volunteer who put their time in to establish mentorship and networking opportunities for all employees of the city of Portland. She helped promote the development of nine affinity groups, assisting with diversity and cultural events, peer support, and creating a supportive equitable and inclusive work environment for all. Debbie has received several awards for her work at environmental services, as well as her volunteer work for the city and the community. In 2010, she received the City of Portland Diversity Champion Award. As well as her work group at environmental services, she won the Blue Heron Award for Public Outreach in 2014. Also in 2014, the American Public Works Association honored her with the Everyday Hero Award for her community outreach work 
on the Willamette River CSO tunnel program. And Pride Northwest honored her with the prestigious Spirit of Pride Award for her advocacy and volunteer work with the LGBTQ community. In 2019, she was honored with a Queer Heroes Award by the Gay and Lesbian Archives of the Pacific Northwest. When Debbie isn't volunteering all her time for DEEP and SCRAP PDS, she can be found making art and receiving lots of canine ad adoration from her five small dogs at home. Debbie models and represents the true commitment that we always look for in diversity. And Debbie, I am honored to present you with the 2019 Robert Phillips Regional Diversity Award at this time. To Debbie, this is the award. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. It has my name on it. They can't take it back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. It's heavy. Oh, I saw my boss's name on that list of nominees. I hope I don't, I hope I still have a job, Taffy. <laughs> Okay, so I was supposed to write a, a short speech and uh, I was up all night thinking about that and right before this, I came up with some speaking points and I saw some past speeches and it's not one of those. Those were really good. <laughs> so everyone's advice was just be you, but this is the PG version. <laughs> I can only be me. So, I grew up here in Portland, and um, I did travel a little. I went to 18 different schools between first grade and 12th grade. Most people assume I had military family uh, hippies. So, I realized from a very young age I was different uh, for many reasons, mostly because of my parents. They were very... Uh, pro-civil rights, and I thank them for that because I grew up with a very strong vision on what was right and um, great morals, and I appreciate that. Um, I also, because of how I grew up in so many different schools, it could have gone very wrong, but I think it helped me in my career doing community outreach and public involvement because I learned to adapt very quickly and very well, and also have a good sense of humor and a positive outlook on things. I had to to survive. Um, I realized I was different early on because all my friends who had crushes on, you know, this, this is gonna age me a little, um, you know, the Hardy Boys, stuff like that. I had a crush on Wonder Woman, so, October 11th, by the way, is National Coming Out Day. So there you go. <laughs> so I, I was one of the founders of DEEP um, because, um, and there's actually two other people that are still on the DEEP Executive Committee that work at the City of Portland, and one is here today, Angie Harris, who's my vice co-chair. She's here, shout out to Angie, thank you. <laughs> And Carolyn Kwan Lee, who is with the Parks and Rec, uh, she couldn't be here today, but she's one of the founders as well. So it's nice, our little Charlie's Angels, if you must, you know, again, dating myself. Um, and we do have an annual Wonder Wo Woman Awards event, so you can kind of see where, that's a Women's History Month, but now you guys know why it's called Wonder Woman Awards. Um, 
even in, you know, with impacts on me as um, a big person, for instance, because I can hide my sexuality or my um, preferences or whatever. Um, I can hide that, and sometimes to my disadvantage. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was walking my dog one day, a uh, very voluptuous chihuahua who's no longer with us. It was six small canines, now it's five. Um, yes, thank you. Rest in peace, Bella. Uh, I was walking my voluptuous little chihuahua down the street, and um, a truck drove by, this guy screams out, and there's this guy walking on the sidewalk towards me, and I'm walking, and this guy screams out of the car, you fat dyke! And I was shocked. The guy looks at me, is surprised, who was walking towards me. And I said, oh my God, did you hear what he called my dog? <laughs> You're not fat, Bella. <laughs> and then I got home, and I was like, oh my God, he called me a dog. I was so excited. <laughs> and then I like made a mental note, what was I wearing? Because then I would wear that to the next you know, Egyptian club you know, gathering so I could get a date. So, thank, thank you. I told you this isn't like the other speeches. <laughs> so, uh, when Mayor Potter was the mayor, um, he, you know, he was the police chief before that. He uh, was the first police chief to march in the gay pride parade. And so, when my dad had passed, he became my adopted dad. And uh, he's kind of like, you know, everybody's dad in the gay community. So um, he, uh, he was pretty awesome. He's the reason we started DEEP in the first place, which is the Diverse and Empowered Employees of Portland, which I made that name up as a joke because we all love acronyms in government, right? And they're all like, let's think of a cool name. And I'm like, how about let's go DEEP for diversity, you know, the Diverse and Empowered Employees of Portland. And oh, that's so cool. I love it. I'm like, really? Okay. So we went with it, and it stuck. People still don't know what it means most of the time, but it looks good. Um, I uh, asked Mayor Potter if I could start an LGBT group, and he says, you know, there's a few other people that want to start affinity groups as well. You guys should meet and get together, and that's how it started. And a lot of the people have retired since then, and we still have about 12 people on our group. Uh, several members of the Deep Executive Committee are here. Um, we have nine affinity groups that are active. We have about 30 affinity group leaders. We have about 1,000 affinity group members. Um, the nine affinity groups are the City African American Network. We have uh, PDX City Mamas. By the way, it has to be PDX City Mamas because a California group got very angry that they were City Mamas because they're City Mamas. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have the Filipino American City employees. We have HAPA Asian Pacific Islanders, Latin Latinx PDX, LGBTQ and friends, uh, Slavic Empowerment Team, Svetlana, yeah. Uh, we have the Veterans Empowerment Team and Women's Empowerment, so very active. We had a couple other groups that um, didn't, uh, we lost leadership uh, due to retirement and a couple of people that moved on. But um, over the years, it's held steady, and I'm really proud of that. In addition to the affinity groups, we have speakers that we've brought in, and we do the cultural celebrations. And, you know, it's, it's been a good experience. I think it helps empower people to network, feel like they belong, and I think that's what it's about. Um, again, keeping a sense of humor and being kind to one another. Um, I think people ask me all the time, why do you do this? Why do you volunteer hundreds of hours to do this? Well, insanity does run in my family. I'm not joking on that one. But luckily I'm on medication. Uh, yeah. Here's to mental health. Let's be aware. Yes. Thank you. I'm not ashamed. It's National Coming Out Day in a couple days for multiple reasons. So, 
Um, the, um, I'm gonna leave you with a quote and an assignment. The quote is from my great, 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 great grandfather, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I know I should be a better writer. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Grandpa. You cannot do a kindness too soon, for you never know how soon it will be too late. So he's good. <laughs> so before you leave today, I want you to do one thing. Be kind to someone. Smile. Smile at someone. It makes you smile back. That made me smile hearing you giggle over there. Be genuine. Compliment someone. Don't do a fake compliment. And don't everybody run up and tell me how beautiful I am because I already know that. Thank you. <laughs> Make a new friend. That's what this is about, getting to know people, learning things. Pass this on. Be kind. We all have differences. Embrace that. Don't hug, though. That's weird. Okay? <laughs> it's an HR violation. <laughs> Thank you very much.